The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No mai hoki mai ki a The Fold, e mihi nei ko Duncan Grieve tokungwa. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Paul Spoonley. Uh, he's not a typical Fold guest in some respects. He's a demographer, and while nominally retired, he also has two two jobs and a whole bunch of other hustles going on. But he's, you know, he he basically is. I think, you know, it's not a stretch to say that he's New Zealand's most eminent demographer. Um, you know, a, a person who studies the sort of makeup of our society. And I first spoke to him for a, a limited series podcast we did during the first wave of the pandemic called Coming Home. And it was really him looking at the the sort of changing migration patterns. And, you know, while, you know, during the course of those interviews, I was sort of blown away by the the depth of his knowledge, his, his sort of, his passion for it, his frustrations with the difference between, you know, how how applicable that knowledge is and, and how incurious some of our uh, institutions can be about it because you know fundamentally Aotearoa is a place which is changing very rapidly and that has profound implications for almost all facets of our society that we're really uh, and this comes across in the interview just not really thinking very hard about and that yeah that 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 we're we're all a bit poorer as a, as a result of that. So that's really what this podcast is about. It is brought to you by O Media, and and you know, we we touch on a a big piece of research that that O our sponsors did um, in collaboration with uh, with Dr. Paul Spoonley. But really, the 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 whole thrust of of this conversation is about you know, how fast New Zealand is changing in terms of its age, its ethnicity, uh, and, you know, it, it just all, all different facets of its makeup and, and, and how that will echo uh, throughout um, this, this uh, you know, or needs to echo and, and will continue to um, out into, into the future. So... Um, and look, as as we we finished the the conversation, Tia here, our podcast manager, sort of said, that, you know, you, you need a lot longer than forty minutes to discuss this. So this is necessarily a, a sort of a primer rather than than going too deep on it. But I, you know, I, I always love talking to to Dr. Paul because of the that combination of deep knowledge and and huge passion he has for the subject, and and always come away thinking. I, we all need to pay a lot more attention to this man. So please enjoy this uh, conversation with Dr. Paul Spoonley on the fold. Then Dr. Paul Spoonley, and welcome to the fold. Kia ora, Duncan. Uh, so I want to start, I feel like de- demography is something that the media almost acts kind of oblivious to at times, g- given that it has such an, a huge impact on on our audiences. Um, and obviously the media is a subset of society, which also probably doesn't pay enough attention to it. But um, I wondered if you could start by talking about the age profile of this country and, and what has happened to it or is happening to it over time. Let, let, let's talk about demography for a second before I deal with the ageing. It's really fascinating in terms of what's happening at the moment, and we're entering an era which we've never experienced as a human society ever. So I'm a baby boomer. When I was growing up, about 8% of the population would be aged over 65 in my community, and quite soon it's going to be over 20%, and in parts of the country it's certainly going to be well over 30%. So 
I would talk about hyperaging, the fact that quite soon, probably around 2025, we'll have more over 65s than zero to 15 year olds. So it's a tipping point in which we begin to see a very different demography emerging. And I agree with you. I don't think that we, we've quite thought that through. I get asked about demography when there's a crisis, when there's something happens. Immigration shoots up or shoots down or when fertility might be an issue, but it tends not to be an ongoing conversation. And in my experience in New Zealand, whether we're talking politically or in terms of you know, a dinner party, I don't think most people understand how transformative demography is going to be through this decade. Yeah, because I mean, and it has impacts everywhere. Like if you have sort of a, a basket of New Zealanders in your head and it's the wrong basket, whether you're making policy or media or food, whatever it is your is your bag, you're going to be making bad decisions and yet, you know, that that you know, I mean, you just described a, t- a, a little fragment in the, in that kind of age band um, or, or basket of the way things are, have changed. So, do you want to maybe drill into that a little bit? Like, so we're we're hyper aging, um, which you know, like what 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 is driving that, and 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 what you know, what are some other ways that you could start to understand that that process as a society? In terms of what's driving it, we would talk about structural and numerical ageing. And the numerical is just simply the size of the uh, cohort that's aged over 65. So that's the baby boomer cohort that was born between 1945 and 1964. It's, It's just a huge cohort. So in 2010, the first of that cohort began to arrive at the age of 65. The structural one's really interesting. So when I was at university studying demography in the 1970s, we would have assumed a pyramid with the largest cohorts being at the bottom. We now invert that and we have the largest cohorts at the top. So the the point about the relationship between the under 15s and over 65s is that we're now seeing the largest part of our community actually being in the older age groups. The baby boomers are the wealthiest and healthiest generation. So not only are they reaching the age of 65, being healthy, they're actually living longer. So there's a longitudinal dimension to it. And I would talk about life expectancy, which at the moment is 23.4 years from the age of 65. That's what you would expect to to live. And what's interesting about that is that we're adding about two years of life expectancy for every decade, and it's not plateauing, so it's continuing to go up. The, 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 The consequences of that are that we're seeing very different consumption patterns, and we're seeing very different wealth distribution. So the baby boomers are not only the wealthiest compared to their parents and grandparents, they're also very wealthy compared to their children and grandchildren. And and quite where that one goes, I don't know. It's really interesting, right? Because yeah, there's a in in our minds, rightly or wrongly, the the like the older New Zealanders, older people around the world were never competed for by advertisers. They were sort of assumed to stay at home, watch TV, not not do a lot, which is not at all um, how how baby boomers are increasingly behaving, and as you just suggested, they've got they're almost the, the only ones with with significant free capital to to deploy. Which you know, so so all of these things have quite profound flow on effects because advertising dictates a, a lot of what media gets made, distributed, funded. And it also has massive flow on impacts into policy. You know, you see the protests in France for around a, a two-year change in, in the pension age when the longevity that you're, that you're just describing for an over 65-year-old has, you know, like people are starting to spend half, if not more than half of their lives, you know, out, outside of the workforce and, and still, you know, that, that, that obviously has, has huge policy implications. Do you find that... You know, when you're speaking to people who work in policy, or, or you know, whether that's uh, members of parliament or, or people in policy, that they understand what has happened and 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 the pace at which it is continuing to develop. The simple answer to that question is no, and my frustration is partly with the lack of engagement with population policy at an at a political level, 
and of course the three-year cycle, political cycle. So I, I, it's really a very frustrating area, area to be working in because I think that you know the retirement commissioner will keep reminding us that uh, there are certain dynamics or consequences of what's happening. Um, but we're not preparing for an ageing society, hyper-ageing society in the ways that I would expect. And we've got good examples. I mean, Japan, Germany are about 30 years ahead of us, so we can look at other societies and think, what is it that they're doing or what is it that we should be thinking about doing? Um, the silver economy or the silver dollar is now huge and the older age groups tend to be quite conservative in terms of what they want to see happen or not happen. And, and I certainly think that um, some of the aversions to discussing the age of superannuation eligibility, um, a capital gains tax, really reflects the resistance of, of, of some of the older community uh, to making those sorts of changes, because there's no doubt that they are largely beneficiaries of not only owning property, but also the increase in the value of that property over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And you also have, you know, the, the, when you, if you think about characteristics of that group, they're much more likely to be voters. And then if they block votes in, in a self-interested way, or if even the, there is a kind of genuflecting from all political parties, lest they scare them off, you know, it's very hard to affect policy change. Do, do you, you know, what, are, there, are there countries that are, which have similar kind of uh, age profiles to ours that have managed to escape that that sort of trap to, to an extent? Well, it's being forced on Japan. So Japan is not only been ageing for the last 20 to 30 years, it's also a country which is now in population decline. So last year, uh, 2022, the Japanese population declined by over 400,000. So they're being forced into looking at what's happening here. But, you know, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about France or Japan. The resistance of these communities, of older communities, to making some of the changes that might be needed is really quite um, significant. And, of course, what I would point out is that uh, we have a universal super, which is, you're eligible for at age 65. It's not means-tested. And, of course, there's um, health care. So we're beginning to see the costs of an ageing society beginning to compound. What I would dearly love us to do is to have a discussion about what policies we should put in place, what provisions we should put in place. So if I take a simple example, we probably need around 12,000 long-term care beds in the next few years. Where are they going to be? Who's going to pay for them? And when you try and raise those questions... Because you, you're talking ultimately about a population policy, is that is that how it gets described? Yes. And and what 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 does that involve? And and you know, like how close are or far are we from from having a meaningful version of that? We're light years away from having a, a meaningful version of it. So the key elements are fertility, which in the moment in New Zealand is in um, decline, so below replacement fertility, hyper aging, which we've talked about. There's regional imbalances in terms of what population looks like and population or demographic profiles look like, and then there's immigration. And you need to put all of those together, and you need to think about it over a long term. And by long term, I mean 10 years, but hopefully longer, 20 or 30 years. So one of the things that we're encountering is that as the population ages, we see a very significant exit out of the workforce. I mean, more over 65s are in paid work than in practically any other country in New Zealand, um, apart from Japan. But ultimately, they will exit the workforce. And so if you, if you look at the US, for example, in the two years of COVID, there were about 3 million people exited the workforce, mostly in the older age groups during COVID. And compounding that was the fact that um, the US is about 2 million down on terms of, uh, in terms of immigrants. So there you've got the two dynamics which are reducing your both overall labour pool but also your talent pool. You also lost a million people to, to just to, death, to COVID, yes, to extra, yes. excess mortality. Yeah. So that, that is one lens to, to understand society. Another, another is ethnicity. You know, there has been historically a, a sort of a 
and whether it's a myth or a kind of uh, a sense of self that, that that we are kind of a bicultural society that you have Pakeha New Zealand and, and Māori New Zealand, which has never been strictly accurate, but is is becoming profoundly inaccurate now. Um, you know how how has you know thinking of, you know the, the average New Zealander is around forty over the, that span. You know if you think about their lifespan. How has the the kind of ethnic composition of New Zealand changed, and what what has driven that? Historically, we worked very hard on keeping some people out from New Zealand, and of course, ninety five percent plus of the migrants that did come here came from the UK and Ireland. So our migrant flows were traditionally very homogeneous. That changed with, of course, the arrival of Pacifica from the 1950s onwards. But the real key moment is the changes that were made by the Labour government in 86, 87, which was to change from a country preference basis for migration to a point system. It didn't work particularly well in the 1990s, so Leanne Delzell had to make some adjustments after 2000. But in the last two decades from that period beginning in 2000, we've seen very high inward flows. And when you look at what contributes to our population growth, the negative is that we see more New Zealanders leaving than arriving. We see some growth around 27, 28,000 from the number of births compared to the number of deaths. But the big factor that has driven our population growth, we've been growing at 2.1% pre-COVID. The big factor, two thirds of that population growth has come from net migration. And it's had two things. One is that it's driven our population growth um, and contributed to our supply of skills and labour in the country, but it's changed our ethnic composition hugely. And as we look out over the next 10 to 20 years, what you'll notice is that Māori will certainly grow. So um, by next decade or a bit after, about one in five of us will self-identify as Māori. So that bicultural element is still there and it's still really important. But what you'll see is that the members of Asian communities are really going to grow very significantly. And they will probably, again, sometime in the next few years, the total number of people in Asian communities will outnumber the number in Māori communities. And certainly here in Auckland, you'll see that probably within two decades, almost 40% of all Aucklanders will self-identify as a member of one Asian group or another. So we've gone from being relatively homogeneous in terms of uh, cultural identity and cultural connections to being one of the most super diverse societies anywhere. And Auckland, about four or five years ago, was named as the fourth most super diverse city in the world, just behind Toronto. So it's a huge change for us. And, And in terms of composition, in terms of consumption, in terms of you know how we how we see ourselves, how we interact with others, how we how we uh, identify with particular communities. I don't think many people quite understand what the twenty thirties will bring. No, and and you know just to kind of circle back to the age thing, like when you think about that over sixty five population, you know versus that that under fifteen population. Not only are they, you know, much more equal in size than they have ever been historically, but they're also vastly different ethnically. Is, is that yes. fair to say? Because that's where there is, you know, an, almost an extra layer of quite distasteful tension, and that you, there's a version of this uh, where, by rather accident than than, but not design, you have an older Pakeha population who's, uh, you know non-means tested, which is the most wealthy cohort in the country, and their their non-means tested super is being paid for by a super diverse working age population. Yes, yes. So essentially when you look at the over 65, three quarters of them will be Pākehā, New Zealand European. Uh, The number who are over 65 and Asian, probably six or seven percent. Uh, But when you get to the younger age groups, and all you need to do is look at a school in Auckland to see what the future face of demography looks like. And typically in a high decile school, somewhere between about 35 and 40% will be from one Asian community or another. Uh, Depending upon where you are, perhaps a large number um, will be Māori and Pacifica. 
And when you look at the school age population, then it is much more diverse. And certainly by the 2030s, when you look at the people entering the workforce, then you're probably talking 50 to 60% who will be Māori, Pacific or Asian. Very different shift from where we have been. And that, yeah, and that's that's the thing which I think that, you know, the, the audience of this podcast is, you know, naturally skews towards media and people in media and communications. And, you know, we, most of that uh, is the, the bundling and selling of, of audiences, yet, which which is, you know, and no, no, no issues with that. But when you... I think that there is some, on some level, in terms of what it is we create, a a bit of a a lack of understanding of just how big, fast, and forever um, a lot of these these well, not forever is always quite a a big term, but you know, like profound and long lasting th- these shifts are. Yeah, you know, for people who work in those kind of industries, what is the correct way to sort of start to process that that kind of information? The word that I would use is diverse or diversity, so that the some of the assumptions that you see in terms of understanding communities and then selling into those communities or attracting interest from those communities has tended to assume a degree of homogeneity, which has been evaporating for some time, but will certainly not be true in the future. So we we did actually look at some of the uh, media patterns of migrant communities. So we were looking at Korean, Indian, Chinese, South African and British. And all of them, all of them have very interesting media engagement patterns that we saw. Certainly in terms of some of the Korean, Chinese and Indian communities, the bulk of their media engagement came via stream, online and homeland uh, media not local media at all. And and the thing that, um, I mean, three quarters of the Asian community here in New Zealand are migrants. And I think we've got a reasonably good handle in terms of that community and those communities and what, what they're interested in. But I think what's going to be transformative is going to be the New Zealand born and raised. And I think they're just beginning to come through as, a, as a, quite a significant cohort through our education system, our secondary and, and tertiary system. And as they enter the workforce and as they enter and, and start and do the sort of job that you're doing, Duncan, I, I think they're going to really change gears quite considerably. And, and one of the things that we looked at in 2010 and we looked at uh, again a couple of uh, years ago was the sports and leisure activities of, of Aucklanders. And what's really interesting there is the number of people playing table tennis exceeds the number playing rugby. Um, rugby's not one of the top 20 sports and leisure activities in Auckland. And, and this is high school participation? No, numbers. this is overall. Overall, But But sure. what you can see is the pattern at high school. So the pattern of playing a particular sport at high school. It, it, it's difficult because we're talking about um, people who are registered to play mm. and what we see is the growth of informal activities, the the neighbourhood basketball court or the, the, the Sunday leagues, football leagues. You know, there's a, there's a whole lot of activity that we probably don't capture very well. Um, but what's been happening is that the, the ageing of the baby boomers who are really committed to their rugby and were rugby players in their time, of course, they now watch rugby. I'm not suggesting that audience numbers are, are, are declining necessarily. But what we're seeing is a much more diverse set of, um, of, of cohorts coming up behind them who really are not as interested in some of our traditional sports as, as we might expect. And I think that's one of those one of those transformational changes which we we need to understand. And so I'd come back to that diversity. I think the I think what we're talking about is ethnic, age, locational, faith diversity, language diversity, and we need to understand that. So one of the things one of the things is that when I look at communities here in Auckland, if you only talk and communicate in English, you're cutting out very significant non-English language communities. 
The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out of home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Talo for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spinoff member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. And the thing that makes all this very difficult in some respects is that to communicate broadly with a super diverse population, you necessarily need to have people who represent or identify um, as those communities or, or, or you know, have, a, have, whether it's language or, or other pathways in, but, but identity is obviously a very good one. But at the same time, you're actually, comp- historically, if you were to do that using, say, community ra- you know, a community radio station, you could have a pretty good confidence that you're going to reach that community because the alternatives were, you know, like language alternatives were kind of nil. But now, as you just described, they, it's very easy to be a citizen of New Zealand whose entire cultural uh, experience is is created somewhere else. And that can even happen within, you know, social media with its al- algorithmically driven content has, has a similar um, dynamic. But if you're it doesn't change the sort of responsibility, that almost existential need to to create content for for those audiences. Do, you know, are there again, are like, are there sort of, be, you know, do you think that it is just waiting for the children of of migrants to come in that might attract them in, or or are there other kind of ways that that you that that process like can can be be sort of hurried along or, or made um, more powerful well one of the things that came out of the original work that we did about sports participation was a group called active asian and active asian that were designed to increase the leisure and sports participation of, of various asian communities and, and one of their leaders and I'm, I'm borrowing here. So one of the leaders said, you need to do certain things. One is you need to have cheerleaders from that community, people that are known and trusted in that community, to be part of your brokers, to advise you, but also to speak out to those communities. The second is not to assume that they will come to you. You need to go to them. Mm-hmm. So what does that look like? And the third is that uh, you need a, a, an online social media presence which attracts them and which might not be in English. And so you begin to you begin to put together a package, and I think most of us would be surprised at how complex that media world is out there. Yeah. I mean, we we think about young digital natives and what they're doing, but I think we need to dissect that in terms of the the ethnic and religious and other dimensions that we're also seeing increase in diversity and begin to understand that there are very different channels, very different interests that are beginning to to emerge there. And yes, they will they will come through and they will begin to shape those. But at the moment, I suspect that um, many in the media landscape are probably not aware. And, and 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 I would confess I don't know either, Duncan. I mean I mean the, the, the O media work I think is one of those that contributes to greater understanding. But to say that we do understand that media landscape and media behaviours, I think we're a long way from that. Yeah, and and even if you were to understand it, it's one thing to go, okay, well, the sort of Chinese language media, um, as WeChat is a the most popular thing, but it's, and you could even, you know, create channels within it. But it's quite another, you know, we live in a highly democratic and and self, you know. But people make their own decisions about uh, it's not if you build it they will come it's just no no longer true to switch uh, tech slightly and and kind of to look into some of the research that you did um, with O Media 
you know, a lot of it is about the, there's been, you know, we haven't even mentioned it, but but post pandemic, there's been quite profound behaviour changes uh, across any number of vectors. What what are you, what 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 are some of those changes, and how sticky are they proving? I mean, the most interesting ones are the ones that encourage us to work online and from home, and I, I think that's that's a universal. But for me, that's slightly exaggerated. I mean, if I could background this by, we did a book called Rebooting the Regions in 2016. What struck me was that the evidence we put in front of some of those regions was simply dismissed. And and the, the, the evidence was that over the next 20 or 30 years, Auckland would grow and many of the regions would experience either stagnation, so they wouldn't grow at all, or they'd experience decline. So we're already seeing that decline in the West Coast, Southland, the Central North Island. And there simply was a dismissal that that was going to happen, that why would anybody live in Auckland? Why wouldn't you come to Hawke's Bay or Nelson and So these were, these were forecasts that, that where the people for, who, for whom decline was forecast just said, that is not the future. No, no, it's not. And if you look at the long-term plan, so all 67 territorial authorities had to submit a long-term plan uh, which took them from 2021 to 2031. And when you look at the demography, because this is about, you know, your and my rates, it's about drains, it's about, you know, the provision of facilities and services by these territorial authorities. But for me, that's underpinned by demography, understanding what's going to happen in the next 10 years in terms of your community. And when, when I look at it, some of them are really good, but many of them simply don't invest much in terms of understanding that demography, or they're in denial. So we we had a pre-2020, pre the lockdown really, we had an incredibly high level of population growth, not only in New Zealand, but also around other parts uh, in terms of many of those regions. But that was driven by a sort of slightly artificial factor, which is the very high inward migration. So in June 2020, we had our highest ever inward migration, net gain of about 80,000 permanent migrants and about 300,000 people here on temporary work and study visas. So it's a very artificial period. And if you use that period, say 2018 to 2020 as your base, you're going to anticipate that population will grow and it's not going to. So it, it, it's it's really difficult to begin to unpack all of that. And I think what's difficult is the Auckland's a primate city, and if you look at primate cities around the world, what you see is a lot of resentment and antagonism by people who don't live in that primate city, and you see that in New Zealand. Define primate city quickly. Primate city is a city that dominates a particular country and economy. So a third of all New Zealanders live in Auckland, and about a third of the New Zealand economy is generated inside the Auckland economy. So just to kind of return to, to the the Omedia study and, and the post-COVID Situation. One of the, you know, along with the work from home ph- phenomenon um, and highly related to it, were, were changes around mo- mobility. What, what do we see there? And and again, how sticky have those behaviours proven? You know, like, you know, because that that there was a there is a big debate about how long, like, are the are these a blip or are these kind of new learned behaviours that will actually um, calcify? And, and to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. I think there's um, there's some behaviours that have emerged during COVID which are very unusual. Going and living in a region with very high lifestyle values, so nice beach, good weather and so on, and an ability to go to a school is all dependent upon having the connectivity and the interaction with people who are colleagues in your particular sector. And there's a very interesting... Um, approach and debate around the geography of jobs. And what we notice is that the big metropolitan centres allow people not only to interact with others easily, Mm. I mean, we can talk about Zoom, but Zoom has limitations. And what we're talking about is you and I going for a coffee or doing something person to person, which is still really important in a social sense. But what we also see is that there are things that uh, big centres give us good health care, good schools, the ability to go to cultural and arts uh, occasions, the ability to have a good barista. You know, it, it sounds banal, but in fact, it's part of the package. And so what we see is that the there's, a, there's an agglomeration effect, which is that, that 
population growth and population density and population diversity also have implications for job creation and for how effective you are. And so we can see in terms of firms that are successful, then being in a big city increases the chances of that success. And, and, and Auckland is our only really thick labour market. Um, once you get into the provinces, what you realise is that the talent supply, the ability to work with others uh, is constrained by that thin labour market. And, and I, th I think that some people have slightly overestimated the COVID effect, that you know people are going to move out of Auckland. People do move out of Auckland. There's a net loss of about 12,000 per people, and that's gone up under COVID by a figure of around 3,000. However, I, I'm, I'm sceptical about that being a long-term effect, given this agglomeration effect that big cities generate. And also, the, you know, the, it's far easier to provide you know, whether it is arts and culture or, you know, high quality rapid public transport in a large city than it is a, a small town. Yeah, one thing, you know, in terms of the study and, and just in general as a demographer, the amount of data, the, um, the volume of data sources and therefore the amount that you can confidently know about both historical and plausibly future behaviours um, has just massively increased. When, you know, when you're working on this study and, and looking at the data that comes out of some of this, like what, what are the data sources and what are some of the sort of stories that have, have grown out of that, that um, you know, these, these new technologies? Let's go with the data source in a general sense to begin with. So we have good statistical data in, in New Zealand, thanks to Stats New Zealand. So when I was contributing to the O Media material, you know, I I use that, and I think that's really important. But it doesn't give us the nuance and the detail of what's happening on the ground. And so one of the things that I I think we desperately need to do is to supplement what we know are trends in a broad sense by looking at how narratives, as as you call them. Uh, begin to emerge, because I think those narratives are very, very different. I mean, wearing a very different hat, Duncan, I, I'm a co-director of Hei Whenua Tarikura, which was a, a recommendation from the Royal Commission, and it's the Centre for Countering Violent Extremism. The thing that strikes me there is that some of the behaviours we're seeing, both good and bad, um, and of course we, we're largely focused on the bad, um, are very different to anything we've ever seen before. So I would I would draw a line around 2015-16 and say there was a, a tipping point there. And what's happened since is that we've been very... The, the, the change in behaviour has been significant, but what's also been significant is where that source of the information and the source of the influence has come from. So when, when I look at, at, at some, of the, um, some of the negative aspects then it's been hugely influenced by America, by, by Trump America, by QAnon. And, and that's new. That, that, that whole dynamic is new to us. And I don't think we understand it. So part of what we're doing at Hei Whenua Tarekura is trying to, get, to, to, to generate research, to, um, to fund research, which will tell us more about those behaviours. Well, why, why are people being drawn into, recruited um, by these media sources and in some cases being radicalised. I'm not sure we, we've, we've got a good handle on all of that. I think that's, that's very new behaviour. That's a, that's a whole different thread, but I, I do think it's fascinating because, because it's new. So, you know, you don't, it hasn't really been allowed around long enough for you to start to really know what, what is happening longitudinally. Is, this, is that, that kind of uh, extremist group growing? Uh, you know, is it further radicalising? Are there techniques which can, you know, walk, walk, walk them back? You know, to, to what extent with that work, is it pure gazing at it in wonder or, 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 like, or is there a way of moving into a, a, a place of actually knowing how, what is a correct way to respond to its rise? Well, th those are excellent questions, Duncan, and I, in most cases I can't answer them. I, we, we just don't simply have enough evidence here. And there's, there is actually some good evidence internationally about the change of behaviour, in this case in terms of social media engagement. 
Um, but I do think we need to understand how it then is, how it's nuanced in a New Zealand sense. Is New Zealand the same as the US or probably not? We're a small society. We've got very different demographic and other cultural dynamics. And so I'm not sure that we have a good understanding of how that plays out in a New Zealand context. And it, it's part of what we've been talking about. I mean, there's demographic change, but what I'd keep emphasising is that demographic change leads to very different consumption behaviours, very different patterns of mobility, which is the O media material. And we need to understand it. A few years ago, we did some work for Auckland Transport, which was looking at whether the transport system anticipated and was responsive to cultural diversity and age diversity. And the answer is no. You know, that, that we, we're operating with patterns and with understandings and um, data, which works well in the rear vision mirror, it's not so good in terms of what's happening currently or into the future. So I, I would just really applaud the O Media and, and anybody else who's trying to unpack this new age. I think it's a new age in terms of demography, but it's a new age in terms of information and in terms of our, the way we live our lives, but also how we produce things, how we work. I mean, I, a few weeks ago, I talked to Westlake Girls, uh, year 13, and I said 65% of the jobs that you will do during your working life have yet to be created, and 40% of the jobs that we currently see, in this case it was in Auckland, will not exist in 10 years' time, but there'll be new jobs. So in terms of the world of work, you know, there are huge changes beginning to emerge and have emerged, and um, technology and, and, and our digital lives are really at the core of that. So alongside the demography, what what's happening in terms of how we live and how we work? Honestly, like it's 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 so good and challenging to to um, to start to to think about those things. And I, I don't think almost any any of us, uh, potentially outside some of the organizations that you work in, are, are really engaging with just how uh, broad and far-reaching those consequences are. But um, look, I, I, I so appreciate you coming onto the fold and, and starting to kind of scratch away at that. So yeah, really appreciate you coming on, uh, Paul Swinley. Thank you, Duncan. That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Kia ora e te iwi, te Aihe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.